Hi, welcome to today's episode of Tomorrow's Leader, where we dive deep on all things leader related. As always, I look forward to these episodes where we have great guests on, and today we have a fantastic guest. Uh, Michelle Hubert is somebody that I've known over the last few years. She's a board member and part of the leadership team for AALU Gamma uh, organization, a fantastic organization in the insurance and financial services industry that does a tremendous amount and impacts uh, positively uh, across the world. And uh, I also got to know Michelle because she's been a speaker on stages across the world. And she and I uh, shared a couple of those stages at a couple of conferences. She is also a regional vice president of a multi-line insurance, regional multi-line insurance company, um, and had a fantastically successful career. So Michelle, welcome. Great to have you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, John. I appreciate the invitation. Oh, absolutely. So there's, there's a lot that I'd love to, to talk about with you. And I just, I think it's great for, for the audience to get a perspective of somebody who's super successful. And uh, I'd love to get your take on a whole bunch of different stuff. But maybe a good starting point is just your story, kind of your backstory, which I don't actually know that much about your backstory. So maybe you could share a little bit about how you got in the industry and you know, a little bit about you. Yeah, glad to do it. So I started um, in the industry as a sales associate working with an agent in, in the multi-line company that I'm with today. Um, so I did that for a year. And about a year into it, the agent that I was working with uh, applied for another position in the company and became an adjuster with the company. And so that's when I stepped into his role. And I was an agent uh, for 14 years, primarily in a very rural part of the state in the northwest part of Kansas, um, in, a, in a little community of about 1,800 people. Um, and, but, but part of that time on the other side of the state in a little bit bigger community. But, so I was in the agent role for 14 years uh, and then moved into agency management and uh, did that uh, for a good amount of time and then stepped into a director of agency role where I partnered with the regional vice president in our state and helped um, support and develop our agency manager team. And we have around 270 agents in the state. So the agents and the sales associates and just making sure that they have all the tools and resources that they need to be successful. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, I was a very slow starter in this business. And so if you had told me, you know, two years in that, you know, my career would have progressed to my most recent position, which is regional vice president, uh, not quite two years in August, I'll have been in this position two years. Um, I never would have believed it. I, early in my career, I, I struggled. I was, I was not a fast starter. I was not one of those people that comes into our industry and is a lightning striker right off the bat. Hmm. That was not me. Um, I definitely had a heart for service. I loved taking care of our clients, um, but I struggled with the sales side of things. Hmm. And it wasn't until several years later when something clicked for me and I realized that I really didn't have to worry about selling anybody anything. That if I was great at building the relationship, and if I was great at educating, that the rest took care of itself. So I was able to take that heart for service and leverage it to find my way to success. And it's different for everybody. It, you know, not everybody takes the same path. Yeah. Um, but that really worked for me. And then, of course, moving into the agency manager role, that served me very well as, as well, because I'm that's that's definitely the way I'm wired. And um, mm -hmm. I absolutely love developing people. I've had some amazing people invest in me and pour into my life. Uh, and and it, it, it totally changed the trajectory of my career. And uh, so, you know, the fact that I'm kind of now at a place in my career where I get to do that for other people, mm -hmm. I, I could get emotional just thinking about it. But Awesome. Absolutely love what I do. Um, it has been an amazing journey. Lots of great growth opportunities along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as you know, just have met some amazing people uh, in my journey as well. 
So let me ask you this. I find it fascinating that you didn't get off to a really fast start because a lot of times people think, okay, the leaders of organizations, uh, they're the ones that really got out of the gates the fastest, but, but you didn't. Do you think that the fact that you struggled early on, how did that impact long-term you as a leader? Did you think that made you better in some way or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I, and I see that in some of our new agents, they have that heart for service and they struggle a little bit with the sales side. And so helping them become comfortable with that and understand that if you just worry about serving those families and you do a great job of that, the sales are going to follow. Mm -hmm. Everything else is going to fall into place. So it absolutely helped me. And it, and it helped me as an agency manager. We all need those lightning strikers on our team, right? Those those once every five year rock stars that we come across. And those are amazing. And, and we would fill our teams with those people if, if we could. But the reality is, is, you know, 10 percenters are 10 percenters because the other 90 percent of us are in the other group. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, I think it, it definitely helped me see potential in people mm -hmm. that maybe they didn't see quite yet. Yeah. And I think it helped me with developing them as well. I'll bet. And people I'm sure could identify with you and you could identify with them. I, I would think, you know, and to be honest with you, I was the same way. I got off to, I barely made it through my first year. And I yeah. always looked back and said, I think that was helpful because I could relate to people. I knew what they were thinking when they were struggling and what it took to turn it around. Um, what do you think was the, the turning point for you? I mean, so many people give up and, and it's not just this career, it's tons of careers if they don't find immediate success. So I guess two questions, what kept you going when you weren't having success and what was it that kind of started the, the turn? Yeah, so it, it, there were multiple things. Um, so I had, um, started to, uh, work on my education. I, I started to pursue a designation in our industry, um, LUTCF. And so that, um, not only exposed me to information, but to other people, which was really beneficial, um, hearing what was working for other people, what they were doing. Um, so I started participating in that and that helped tremendously. Um, early in my career, some people listening might be able to relate to this and maybe there was a time period for you, but, um, I, I was, uh, spending my time with the wrong people and I was being, I was, I, I, I preach all the time now, be careful who you're being influenced by mm -hmm. because I wasn't being careful who I was being influenced by. And, um, I was hanging out with the complainers and the, you know, the underperformers. And so I started to change my circle and started to change who, who I was being influenced by. Um, but right when those things were happening, there wasn't enough time yet for there, be, there to be a visible impact on my results from those changes that I was making. Um, and about, I want to say about three years in, my agency manager actually sat across the desk from me and asked for my resignation. Wow, really? Yeah. And, and I, I can look back and say rightfully so. Like I wasn't contributing at the level that I should have been. I wasn't growing the book of business. Um, but I was just young and stubborn and, and maybe a little bold. And I, I just said, I'm not quitting. You know, you can, you can terminate my contract if you want to, but I'm not going to quit. Do you think that was a test? Was he testing you or she testing you? Do you think? No, I, yeah. no, mm. no, I, I, he was sent there to terminate my contract wow. that day, and you said um, no. but he didn't. And, um, like for months I lived in fear of that. I lived in fear that he was going to walk back in my door, but I just, it, it almost, um, it almost um, energized me a little bit more. You know, we all have that, I'll prove you wrong, that little bit of chip on our shoulder. Um, and and I, so I, I just stayed committed to the path that I was already on and to, to spending my time with the right people, to getting more confident and gaining more knowledge. And it, star it started, things started to shift. And that's about that same time period, John, when I was figuring out, oh, I don't have to be an obnoxious salesperson right. to be successful in this business. You can just be yourself. 
I can leverage my strength mm -hmm. and I can build relationships and I can educate and good things happen mm -hmm. when I do that. And so all of the, it wasn't one, it wasn't any one of those one things. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a progression of all of them yeah. coming together. Um, but, but honestly, it wasn't that long after that, that things started to change dramatically. And I started to qualify for company trips and ultimately, you know, qualifying for MDRT. And, but think about that for a second. You know, I went from being asked to leave mm -hmm. wow. to that fast. qualifying for MDRT. Yeah. That's amazing. So this was just, this was a combination of fuel in your, fuel to your fire uh, the, the desire to prove him wrong and prove yourself right. And then, and really being deliberate about who you surrounded yourself with and getting, right. the, I've heard the, the, um, the analogy that you've got your garden of life and you've got to pluck the weeds out of it sometimes, you know, and that's hard, right? I mean, that's not easy. People talk about it. It's easy to say, but to do, depending on if this is a business, you know, circle or it's personal, um, how, how we, it sounds like that was a game changer for you, Oh yeah. but it's not easy though, right. To, to remove those people. No. And it's not like, I, so I, it's not that I, um, it's not that I didn't have those relationships. It's not that I didn't still like those people as human beings. Um, I just started spending more of my time with people who were, were where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't engaging in the conversation about how terrible things were. And, you know, I, I, I guess I started to recognize. And, and so it's not like I completely cut those people out of my life or, you know, they were part of our, um, our area and our territory and, and good and good people, just not in the place I was in at that particular moment in time. Yeah. And so I, it was probably, it was, it was definitely outside my comfort zone. So I'm an introvert at heart. So people who experience me professionally tend to think that I'm an extrovert, but that's not true. I am very much an introvert. Um, it was probably more difficult for me to try to attach myself to the people that were doing really well. Because that wasn't your normal way of, right. of being. Okay. Right. So you had to really step out your, outside your comfort zone to do that. Right, okay. right. And I asked to be included in a study group that was um, a, a, an industry icon put on for us. Um, I'm sure you might be familiar with the Kinder Brothers, but um, yeah. it was an MDRT study group and I asked to be included in it. And I have no idea how I wormed my way into that. Because if you looked at on paper, I should, I should not have been in that group. Yeah. But, but, uh, somehow I got into it and that, you know, that definitely was, um, a turning point mm -hmm. as well. Well, that's, that's how I qualified for MDRT the first time. Wow. Was being part of you that know, study group. And what's amazing because I, I think a lot of times people, I, my, my personal opinion is that sometimes the people that came out of the gates fast and they've never had anything but success it's hard for them to be conscious of what created the success because some of it may just come naturally. They don't know. It's harder for them to step into a leadership role where they're teaching other people because they don't know what turns a business from at the bottom to the top. Uh, they don't necessarily know all of the different emotions and thoughts that somebody who's really struggling has. So I think that's valuable really to go through that. Do you find that? Do you feel like the best yeah. leaders sometimes are the ones that that we're not the ones having success. It's almost the opposite of what you think. Absolutely. Because sometimes those people that are, that are quick out of the gate and they're just wildly successful, they, they don't know how to teach what they do. Yeah. They're almost unconsciously competent, which is good for right. them, but not good for other people because you have to take it a step back and be consciously competent or even right. consciously incompetent to really be able to teach. So that's great. So now you were, you had said that you were, um, you, part, part of why you got into this was you were influenced by other people that really had a dramatic impact on you. Anybody in particular, who, who was the most influential for you? Yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's definitely three that along the way that were incredibly influential. Um, 
the first one being Jack Kinder because of that MDRT study group. Um, Jack is the one that that hosted that, and um, he just really uh, um, took me under his wing, so to speak, and uh, mentored me. And then when I stepped into the agency, that relationship has gone on since then, for years and years and years, um, until Jack uh, had had failing health. But he and I had a relationship. Um, and then when I stepped into the agency manager role, I got a hold of him and I, I essentially begged him to coach me. I just said, Jack, I, I don't have five years to figure this out. Like I got to figure this out immediately. And he, and he pushed back and he was like, I'm not, I'm not coaching managers. That's more Gary's thing, you know? And, and I begged him and he agreed to do it. Well, about two months into that, he had a stroke and, and then had progressively failing health. But at that time I transitioned to his brother, Gary. And Gary started coaching me and different times throughout the years, um, I did coaching with him and uh, I've been to his place uh, in, in Dallas and have participated in several of his events. And um, he's had a tremendous amount of influence on me. And so that was a, if I'd have never wound up in that study group, that would have never happened, right? Mm -hmm. And that was one of those moments, and there's several moments, but that was one of those moments where I was bold and courageous and I just said, I want to do this. You know, even though on paper, I shouldn't have been in that group. Mm -hmm. um, and so definitely him, um, definitely the previous RVP uh, in the role that I'm in, uh, invested a ton in my professional growth and development um, and was a great mentor for me. Um, and, and, and really taught, he really taught me how to invest in others and help them grow and develop as leaders. And so that, that was <clears throat> career changing. And then a little bit later on, um, I had participated in an, an industry opportunity with Gamma International Essentials of Leadership and Management with Conk Buckley. And Conk Buckley is a, another industry leader, but um, he has poured into my life ever since. As a matter of fact, I just talked to him on the phone Sunday to see how he's doing. And um, But those, those people, uh, tons of other people along the way, right? Like countless other people along the way have um, influenced me and have brought a tremendous value to my life. But when you ask the question, those are the three definitely that, that rise to the surface. That's great. What's fascinating to me is sometimes the influence somebody has, they don't even know they're having, or sometimes it could even be a, a brief moment. I know for me, there was somebody by the name of Jack Kimbler who spoke to our group. This was back 25 years ago as a first year advisor. And, and he said one thing that totally transformed my thinking. And it was, if you want to double your income, double the amount of people you see each week. And it's actually something my manager had said all the time. But for some reason that day, it triggered something in me. And I just went on a you know mission to see as many people as I could. Simple, but it works. Um, but it, what's kind of cool about leadership is you, it, it makes you wonder, you know, you've been on stages so much and spoken to large audiences and you've impacted people individually that, you know, that that's, there's, there's, ultimately got to be so many people out there that either would now or will say the same about you, that you have had that impact on people and that's uh, you change the direction or course of their, their life. Uh, so that's got to feel good. That's got to be. Yeah. I mean, hopefully, right. If we're, yeah. if we're doing what we should be doing every day and yeah. we're pouring into people and we're developing them and we're investing in them and we're cheering for them. Yeah. Hopefully that's the legacy we're creating too. Yeah. So let me ask you that you've been through a lot of, of, of just this such success and accomplishment. And by the way, it's always interesting too, when you think about one decision impacting everything else, your decision to throw yourself in that uncomfortable kinder uh, training, um, which you, you ultimately look back on, that was kind of the turning point. Uh, that's, that's one day, one decision that ultimately affects possibly the rest of your life. Right. So I always reflect, I'm always fascinated by that. I remember, I know, you know, there, there was a decision I made early in my career that took me down a whole different path. And it had to do with a, with a, uh, I was a 21 year old intern at somewhere and right before, and it was my, my original company. And the, the, my leader was, 
would never look at me and I'd be doing an interview uh, one-on-one -on -one with him and he would always turn his back and do other stuff and kind of made me feel like unimportant. And, and I remember how much that bothered me. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I know I'm nobody, but just why not pay attention to me and give me some time. And uh, because of that, I started in a whole different office. I just didn't even want to start my career there. And I started in a different office and I was reflecting with somebody recently how this entire chain of events that has affected my entire life has happened because of that decision. Um, so it's kind of interesting when you think about something like that, that decision yeah. opened up a whole new world for you, really. Yeah. How about outside of work? So how you, I, all this stuff that you've been through in this and leadership and influence in other people, how has leadership impacted the other arenas of your life? Yeah. So a couple of different areas, I would say, um, from an industry perspective, and then of course, you know, everything comes back to family. So I'll, I'll circle back around to that. But, um, from an industry perspective, it's just, um, it has enriched my life in ways that I don't even know that I can articulate. I, um, I've been part of an industry organization, Gamma International, for many, many years. I served on the Gamma Foundation Board for many years and then served on Gamma International. And, and a few years ago, um, threw my, ring, my hat in the ring to, to step into the executive leadership team. And there was a lot, and, and quite honestly, there was a lot of fear and anxiety around that decision. It, and it was just, um, you know, something totally new. And uh, in that particular organization in our industry, um, I don't typically fit the mold of what leaders look like. Um, so it, very male dominated, um, very big life company dominated. Um, I'm with a, a regional multi-line company. Um, so, so I believed I, I didn't fit the mold, but what I came to realize was that potentially I was more reflective of our general membership than other people were and of our future membership as well. And so um, that was one of those decisions that I, if I had let fear get in the way, I, I wouldn't, before, before these two organizations merged, I was the secretary and so I, I was running the chairs and would have become the president. Um, of Gamma International. I, and after making that decision and being in that room and in those conversations and deepening those relationships, I just, I, I constantly think like, wow, I would have missed this. I, how, you know, what a huge miss it would have been not to be in this room with these people doing this work. Right. you know? And so that, that's another way. And if I hadn't developed as a leader over the years, I never would have had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you have to develop yourself. You have to learn, you have to grow, you have to get better. You have to expand your network. You have to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. I never would have had that opportunity. And does so that, does that come from, so the, the, it, it, does that, does it get easier to overcome your fears as you get, as you do it more? I guess that's my question. I think so. I think so. Like for me in this season of my life, I'm a lot more bold and courageous than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't know, I, I think for me, maybe it is experience. Maybe it's using that muscle. Um, now, honestly, when something scares me, I'm more likely to do it because I know you know, that that's all the good stuff is on the other side of that. Yeah. Well, I just, if, yeah, I'll go on. Well, and if I don't, you know, if, if I allow fear to be the decision maker, there's a, there's a quote that I, I love to use, which is, you know, if you took fear out of the equation, what decision would you make? Oh, that's great. I love that. And I, I'm, I feel more empowered in this season of my life, I think, to take fear out of the equation. And to just, just to leap forward. And so, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, I think it's the realization of, of what all you would miss out on. How do you, uh, cause there's kind of two different types of fears. I think about fears of making a decision, um, which is something that is a lot of thinking and it's processing and it's weighing things and pushing yourself to do it. 
But then there's also fear of a moment and you really can't, the, 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 the ball is already rolling. And you, it's, I'm thinking about you saying you're an introvert and you speak on stages in front of thousands of people. I mean, do you ever get nervous? Do you ever get? <laughs> no. So it's so funny. Like that part doesn't scare me. That part gives me energy. Like I love, I might have a low level of anxiety before I go on, but it's very minimal. Mm -hmm. It's more like creative energy than anything. Mm -hmm. um, that energizes me. Put me in a room with 15, 20 people and I have to work the crowd and network. Wow. That's so it's, it, so, so it's funny that you brought that up because if I'm being, I, I'll be honest and I'll tell you this story. Go into my very first board meeting for that organization. I literally was trying to find any excuse not <laughs> to get out of it because I, I was just so anxious about my place in that group. And of course, now I know that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There's, they're amazing people and they were amazingly welcome to me. And I have a voice in that group. And so all of those fears were completely irrational. Mm -hmm but they felt real to me. And so much so that I was like, you know, do I, am I getting sick? Like <laughs> thinking of all the ways I could get out of going to that. And I got to tell you, every time I'm in a, a, a room with those people, I'm just sitting there filled with gratitude. Wow. Just filled with gratitude that um, they're in my life and that, and that I'm being influenced by those people and the, the important work that we're doing. And, um, so yeah, I, we all have our own, you know, I stage of 2000 people, no big deal. Doesn't, it, it, as a matter of fact, I draw energy from it. It's yeah. the smaller groups right. that, that I'm all, more of an introvert. It's funny. Everybody has it. Everybody has those things that, Ooh, wow. yeah. I'm in that situation. That's going to scare the, you know, what out of me. Um, but it, what's, you know, you draw from your past experiences. So you know that every time you step into a situation that's filled with fear or anxiety that if you push yourself through it, you know, on the other side, good stuff is going to happen. Uh, how do you help somebody that you're working with or a family member or somebody that may not have that background, that, that track record? How do you help them do it? You know, it's the right thing maybe to just step over it and just push yourself through the fear barrier, but you've, I'm sure gotten pretty good at helping other people do it. How do you do it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, the times that we're in right now are a perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is, it's super easy right now. There's all this fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And I, it's super easy right now to get stuck in that because when we don't know what to do, we don't do anything right. Mm -hmm. It's par It can be paralyzing. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's help, helping them take action, some kind of a, control what we have control over, right? Let's, and, and, and making it, it bite-sized pieces, you know, what, what could we do? There's a lot we can't do right now, but what can we do? Mm -hmm. And what would that look like? And so I think oftentimes it's just, it's taking people by the hand sometimes mm -hmm. and saying, let's do it together. Like, let's, let's take this step together because my experience is when you do that with somebody, when you like take them by the hand and you just help them get started nine times out of 10, that's all they need. Mm -hmm. Starting is the hardest part. That's all they need is somebody to help them get off dead center and get moving a little bit. And so, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, all of your experience plays into that. And, and I, I think that's what we're called to do right now is just to help it take everybody that we can by the hand yeah. and, and help them move forward any way we can. And I think a lot of that is people um, sometimes try to, you know, win the game of life on their own and they don't realize you need, everybody needs outside support. And that's why you have coaches. That's why, you know, you find the most successful people you know, ironically, you would think, okay, well, they don't need a coach. They're the ones that have a coach, right? They're the ones that hire people that are willing to pay a lot of money to get the right people, you know, advising them and coaching them. And sometimes it's for that reason. You need that outside influence. That's right? exactly right. And I've paid for coaching for most of my, you know, once things started to turn for me, most of my career, I've paid for coaching. Um, and, 
and it's more important now than ever. I mean, I, I'm probably collaborating with other people more right now than, and I'm, and I have a high level of collaboration at all times, but it's, it's even more critical right now for me me to be, you know, talking to people like you, to be talking to other industry experts, to be talking to people outside of our business, but are struggling with some of the same things. And so um, you're exactly right. None of us can do it alone. And every one of us gets stuck. Every one of us is in that place at some point. And so I think I think it's, you know, just reassuring people that like, look, it, it's okay for you to get stuck, but it's just not okay to stay there. Like, let's, what do we, what can we do together? Let's do something right. to exactly. get moving. I, uh, I think it took me 10 years before I hired a coach and I've, I've worked with one ever since, but it's funny. I think back and I'm like, wow, I probably could have gotten in three years to the point it took me to get in 10 if I had actually had a coach in those early years when I needed it. You know, I couldn't agree more. more. You know, yeah, it's crazy. So now in this crazy time, and I, somebody may be listening to this podcast or watching it some point in the future, but we are April 29th, I think it is, right in the middle of the quarantine uh, historic period of time. How do you, how do you, two questions, how do you lead yourself during this? I mean, this is mm -hmm. tough for anybody. And then, you know, how does that play into how you're helping other people? Yeah, so great question. And, and step one is leading ourselves, right? Like if, if if our bucket is empty, we can't we can't fill other people's buckets. And so, um, for me personally, it, it's it's staying committed to to what I know I should be doing and what works. Um, I'm exercising every morning. I do my devotional every morning. Um, whether whether you know this is the first time i've been in my office in i don't know four or six weeks something whatever it's been um, i've been working from home just like many many people are um but i i show up dressed and ready to play every every single day mm -hmm. and to me that's that i think it just feels like something i have control over you know so just trying to control those things that we have control over so for me personally you know, making sure that I'm reading the right things, making sure that I'm listening to the right things, um, doing the things that fill my bucket so that I've got that energy so that I can, I can transfer it to other people, I think is the most important thing. So th those are the things that I do to take care of myself. Um, I think, you know, taking care of our teams, you know, there's four things that, that people always want from their leaders and, and it's no different right now than it is at any other time. They want, they want trust, they want compassion, they want stability and they want hope. And, and that's, it, there's probably a magnifying glass on the, on those things right now. Right. So, you know, trust, you know, making sure that you're visible, making sure that they feel that you care, you know, making sure that, that they feel like they've been heard and that, and that they have a voice. Um, compassion plays right into that. Like, are they informed? Um, are, they, are they able to tell their story? Are we communicating at a high level? I keep saying quadruple your communication. Mm -hmm. and, and people say, oh yeah, 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 we're doing that. We're doing that. And then I say, but email doesn't count. Mm -hmm. So now have you quadrupled your communication? You know, phone calls, text, emails, Zooms, videos, you know, email doesn't count. And so really making sure that you're communicating at a high level so they can feel that, mm -hmm. that transparency and that vulnerability from you and that compassion and, and then stability, making sure that they have the tools and resources that they need to be successful, making mm -hmm. sure that they feel prepared mm -hmm. and, and that they can have success and they have clarity around what's going on. Uh, and I think all of those things then compound and lead into hope. Mm -hmm. And, and hope I think really comes from knowing that there's a clear plan that we know what we're supposed to be doing every day. Mm -hmm. Um, so are, you know, is there some kind of a, a, a clear plan of what we can be doing every day? And, and, and if, you know, recognizing quickly if somebody gets stuck and, and helping them move forward. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, when you circle back to compassion, um, it's understanding that everybody has unique challenges right now. I mean, my husband and I, we were empty nesters. So we don't have kiddos at home right now. 
right? Like, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people have uh, mom and dad both trying to work from home while they're trying to be parents. And so just really understanding that everybody has a very unique situation that they're, that they're trying to navigate. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I, I, I would say that every day I'm focused on those things, mm -hmm. trying to help our team any way that I can. That's great. And you talk about the, the, the communication, I agree a hundred percent. That's got to be quadrupled. And uh, I was talking to somebody recently who was saying how his team had given him feedback that they wanted to see his face, not just on a zoom, you know, hear the voice and just the fact of seeing his face was, was a, a calming, yes. reassuring, confidence building uh, feeling. And uh, that, that was really eye opening. And, but it's true, right? You need to, the more that people can feel connected to you and just even the facial expressions and just looking in somebody's eyes uh, is whole different than just getting an email or a text. Absolutely. You have to be really careful. P I couldn't agree with what you said more. People want to, you need to be visible. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, they're going to feel like you're hiding. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it's so, the same in an office. If somebody's in their office, physical office and not walking around, they have their door closed all the time. I mean, that's, that's right. That, you know? Yeah. That's one right. of the kinder brothers, I can't remember which one taught me, like, are you walking slowly through the crowd? Mm -hmm. And I think about that often. Yeah. Am I walking slowly through the crowd to make sure that I'm connected, you know, to your point of it, even if you're in the office, are they stopping by? Are they saying hi? Are they checking in? You know, yeah. are they visible? Yeah. I used to have a, uh, a very influential leader of mine who, who would keep a big jar of M&Ms uh, on his table, on his desk, so that that would lure people in. And it was specifically for that reason. He didn't really even eat them that much, but he just wanted people to come in and you know scoop out some m&ms and like that would be now they're they they talk the more you can yeah. communicate with people and you've seen that too i'm sure sometimes the 30 second conversation that you have with somebody in a really unplanned you know setting it's not a one-on-one -on -one, it's not a meeting or anything like that that's where you get the best information or you find out that something's not right or you can give them some advice that's super impactful you know, that, those are the meaningful moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. Well, I, w I would love to keep talking with you forever because there's so much good stuff. Um, but it, just in the sake of time, what, what any final uh, words of wisdom, advice for people that are listening? Anything that you think is good for them to walk away with additional what you've already shared? Yeah, I would just say um, now's the time to be bold and courageous. Um, you know, the bar for you and and for the people that you're leading should not be surviving. You know, we shouldn't be waiting this out. We shouldn't be just trying to get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, the bar should be thriving. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all learning so much. And there's so many good things that are going to happen when we come out on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, uh, I'm from Kansas. So our football coach likes to say, win the dang day. Um, so we're, we're really focused on moving that bar beyond surviving up to thriving and making sure that we're, we're finding a way to win every single day. Well, I think that this period of time, we're going to come out of it and people will look back and say, there was a lot of good that came out of this. If nothing else, it pushes people into new territories, uh, uncharted waters. And, you know, to your point, when you do things like that, that may be uncomfortable, you come out of it stronger, better, new skills, new hobbies. I mean, I, that, I don't know if you're finding that too, but oh. I'm doing things differently. You know, my routine is different and taking on new hobbies even that I didn't have before. That's kind of cool. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, Michelle Hubert, thank you for joining us. This has been absolutely fantastic. And uh, you've been offered some great insight and great uh, pieces of wisdom for us. So I hope you can come back at some point in the future. I know we were talking about that earlier, that uh, down the road a bit, just to circle back with our group here. Okay. Sure. Would absolutely love to, John. Thanks so much for having me today and appreciate the partnership.
All right, you got it. Well, thanks everybody for listening to today's episode of Tomorrow's Leader. Be sure to uh, hit the like button, share it, add comments, subscribe. This is available on YouTube and also all the other podcast outlets and uh, appreciate you joining again. Michelle Hubert, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.